Yeah, okay, that's the end of the video, great. Okay, so we're starting our panel on unraveling Iran's nuclear proliferation and terrorism proxies. Uh, I think we're gonna do a round specifically about terrorism, then a round also about nuclear issues, and then we'll see if we have time to say a tiny little word about Iran and the Saudis' Abraham Accords. Um, introductions, um, we have on my left, uh, Dr. Vera Mironova, Associate Fellow Davis Center, Harvard University. She is renowned for ethnographic fieldwork with armed groups and conflict zones, terrorist cells, and criminal organizations globally. She was embedded with the Iraqi Special Operations Forces during the Mosul operation. We probably have to have like a whole session about that some other time. And she was with the Ukrainian Armed Forces in Donbas. Since 2012, she's conducted in-depth interviews with members of terrorist groups originating from the former Soviet Union. She's the author of award-winning books. Uh, next, we have Dr. Eli Carmon, senior researcher at ICT and an authority in the fields of international terrorism, political violence, CBRN terrorism. He was a member of a UN uh, commission. Um, he was also an advisor to the Israeli Ministry of Justice, uh, dealing with uh, NATO workshops and the Atlantic Forum. Sorry? What is it? I say Ministry of Defense. Ministry of Defense. Yeah, it's in the abbreviations here, I messed them up. Okay, uh, Dr. Carmon is published extensively and is a frequent commentator in global and Israeli media on Middle Eastern issues. And we also have um, Dr. Emmanuel Otolenghi, Senior Fellow, Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. And he is also an expert in its Center on Economic and Financial Power, focused on Hezbollah's Latin America, illicit threat networks, Iran's history of sanctions evasion, Previously, he headed a transatlantic institute in Brussels and taught Israeli studies at St. Anthony's College, Oxford University, and he obtained his PhD in political theory at Hebrew U. Um, I'm going to keep my introduction short because I got permission from the powers that be to plug my new book. So aside from writing for the Jerusalem Post, I'm the author of the upcoming book, Target Tehran, coming out with, uh, by Simon & Schuster, uh, September 26th, about the Mossad. Um, and it's war against Iran's nuclear program, so we'll get to that in the second round. Without further ado, um, let's start with uh, Vera. Vera, we said that you were going to talk about Iran's influence in Iraq um, and the IRGC network. Oh yeah, so everybody gets six minutes except Ellie is getting eight minutes because he's doing a PowerPoint. I'm going to go like this when you're over your time. I'm very subtle. Okay. Hello everyone and thank you for inviting me. So. I'm, I have to talk about Iran influence on Iraq, but studying Iraq and what's going on there now, uh, with due respect to you know Iraqi people who are there, it feels like there is no like Iran influence on Iraq. But for Iran particular purposes, Iraq sounds more like its backyard. So, for example, every time like you look at the border and the movements uh, that Iran is conducting, the question is if there is any border to start with. Because, you know, if in the, I don't know, a year ago there would be trucks going in and out, maybe covered with fresh vegetables, you know, some weapon stuff covered with French, uh, fresh vegetables, I think right now, like, no one even bothers with fresh vegetables. Which is a shame, because they are more useful for local population than weapons, but, uh, so this border is, if it is there or it's not there, it's okay for Iran either way. Then, uh, of course, we all know about uh, secret, we all know about the famous secret Iranian bases in Iraq. So again, they are so secret that no one cares anymore if they're secret or not. And so they, they have that there. Uh, in addition to like storing weapons in, in public places that could not be targeted. Um, of course, we know that recently, for example, U.S. government, uh, through the Department of Treasury, was trying to do something with Iraqi banks because, again, Iraqi banks are actively used uh, as, I don't know, Iranian banks. So basically, money is going back and forth, and including dollars, which are not allowed to be in Iran. But again, no one cares. So, uh, so I'm not sure how to like talk about it as a use of Iraq because it feels like, you know, they don't have any resistance or problems doing it. And of course, using, again, Iraq and going to Syria, the no border issue is Iran-Iraq and then Iraq-Syria. So again, no one kind of 
has a problem with stuff moving to Syria and further, I guess. So uh, documents, uh, how many Iranians, I'm sure, using Iraqi documents to travel around the guys on sanctions. And again, it's, it's OK. I mean, it's not OK, but like they don't have a problem doing it, seems like. So, so the question is actually how much autonomy now Iraq does have in relations to Iran. And the same with parts of Syria, but Syria is more complicated because, for example, Russia is a bigger actor there. So in terms of Iraq, it feels like it's a very con convenient, uh, convenient proxy. Not like armed groups in Iraq are proxies of Iran, the question that was raised. But actually, you know, Iraq is a convenient proxy for Iran to conduct its operation. But the question is, what could be actually done about it? You know, like, okay, we found out who is guilty, great. So, but, but what can be done about it? No one could actually bomb Iraq because we didn't quite declare war against Iraq. And for US, you know, it's a very sensitive issue dealing with Iraq to start with. And uh, the storages for weapons, they're not only those secret Iranian bases that like, okay, you could target probably, but they st store weapons in Iraqi military facilities. And again, no one declared war in Iraq, right? So hitting their federal police uh, positions would be, you know, declaration of war. No one was gonna go for that. So politically, of course, the local people don't like it. And that's an understatement. I mean, imagine you live in there, right? And there is some kind of next door Iran like coming and messing up with you. You wouldn't like it, right? But they have absolutely, they couldn't do anything. And uh, I mean, it's a dictatorship of Hajjabi and uh, those militias in Iraq. And people couldn't do anything. And right now, when Iran is, like right now, last couple of weeks, when Iran is much more worried about possible operations of Israel, US, and UK and coalition against Iran. They intensified everything they used to do before. So we have, again, disappearance in villages. They, are parano they have paranoia that everyone is spying on them among Iraqi local populations. So they're arresting, detaining them, executing, you know, everything that was done before, just now on a bigger scale. So of course, it's a terrible situation, but the question is that um, I want, it, I mean, it's a theoretical question at that point. What can be done about it? And it's a much broader issue, not only in Iraq, because like, as I mentioned with passports, right? Uh, Iranians on Iraqi passports could basically travel somewhere and, you know, including to US border and so on and become the asset there. Okay, I guess my time You invited by your time, that was fantastic. Thanks. Okay, uh, so next we'll go over to Emmanuel. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Always a pleasure to be back here at, uh, at the ICT Summit. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Pleasure to be in front of this audience this afternoon. I guess uh, we could have made this panel a lot faster just by saying, read the Mossad chief's speech last night. Uh, and for questions, just send an email to chief at mossad.il. Um, clearly, he read an advanced copy of your book, uh, Target Iran. Um, um, so further questions, maybe read the, read the book when it comes out. But um, to sort of address the, the issues that we're dealing with today, uh, with the specific focus in my area, which is Latin America, what is Iran doing there? I would break it down into uh, mainly four categories. The first is Iran has, is a sovereign country and uses the trappings and tools of a sovereign nation to advance its goals and interests, very much like every other nation does, through embassies, um, you know, bilateral and multilateral uh, forums, agreements, people-to-people, -people, commercial scientific uh, uh, agreements, exchanges of delegations, uh, visits, and so on. But of course, because Iran is not just a sovereign country, but also a revolutionary power, which aspires to play a hegemonic role even beyond the region and to be part of a coalition of authoritarians across the world. It, of course, uh, emphasizes in its uh, quest for diplomatic relations in the region, cooperation with like-minded countries. So it's building and cementing 
an alliance of authoritarians in the region, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, to some extent Bolivia, uh, and sort of using those relationships to uh, essentially build forward operating bases in the region through its friendship with these countries. And of course, if you go back 20 years when the Venezuela-Iran operation started developing, at the time, it was very much a relationship among equals. Iran needed Venezuela's help, especially after 2005, 2006, to evade the growing list of uh, international US, European autonomous sanctions and UN sanctions, uh, and Venezuela was providing that help. But today, that relationship has very much changed. Today, Venezuela and the other countries in the region that are sort of within the same uh, mindset with Iran very much depend or depend a lot more on Iran to support them. And so Iran has become much more of a patron uh, in the patron-client relationship with countries like Venezuela, and it uses its leverage and clout and the ability uh, to help Venezuela and the other authoritarians in the region in exchange for access and the ability to use and abuse those countries uh, to advance its own goals. So that's the first, the first part. The second, uh, the second part is that, of course, Iran, as I said, is a revolutionary power. And so in addition to building relations that advance its goals, it seeks to spread its doctrines and ideology across the, across the world. It has an operation or several operations advancing propaganda through a variety of means across the world. And it has always looked to Latin America as a fertile ground to expand uh, and, and spread its ideology. Why Latin America? Overwhelmingly Christian, mostly Catholic. Um, why would they find uh, the Iranian ideolog ideology and the, Iran the ideology of the Iranian revolution appealing? Because the Iranians are very versatile and, and sophisticated in the way they calibrate their message. As many of you probably know, they do the same in other places. For example, in Europe, they're emphasizing building relations uh, and cooperation with extreme right-wing movements on the notion that they, alongside Syria, Russia, are defending uh, Christian minorities, they're defending traditional values against the degeneracy of the West, and so they pair up with extreme right in Europe. In Latin America, they essentially present the figure of uh, the Imam Hussein as an Islamic Che Guevara, just to make it extremely succinct. That's the message. And so they've been able, through a variety of tools, most of which are funded and coordinated by the regime in Tehran, to spread their ideology. They have an ambitious project which uh, relies on more than 100 cultural centers across the region. They're converting uh, Latin Americans. They're not just reaching out to local Muslims. They're specifically targeting non-Muslims, recruiting them, radicalizing them, indoctrinating them, they're shipping them back to Iran, they're training the, the most talented ones to become clerics, so they have native-born clerics uh, across the region, they're training some of them to become political activists, some of them have already run for elections or entered and joined ruling parties and, and acquired positions of influence in local governments. Um, uh, in, you know, in Chile, for example, uh, a very sort of uh, public advocate and propagandist for the regime in Iran is now an advisor for the Minister of Health. Uh, a cleric trained in Iran from Sao Paulo in Brazil is, um, has just joined the, uh, the, the, the ruling party of uh, President Lula and so on. So they spread their ideology. The third uh, area, and I will conclude with this, I'll leave the fourth for the questions if we have any. The third area is, of course, that they use also their proxies for a variety of illicit activities, and that pertains to Hezbollah. Hezbollah has a global footprint. It self-funds independently to a large extent. We can debate about what percentage of its budget comes from Iran and what doesn't, but there is a significant chunk of that money that Iran Find, uh, that Hezbollah provides for itself through independent activities, typically uh, through uh, interfacing with criminal organizations. In Latin America, you have extensive diaspora communities from Lebanon, Shia communities. Hezbollah uses the same method it uses in Lebanon to essentially recruit these communities, indoctrinate them, and make them loyal. 
uses informal and formal networks, sends their, their clerics and teachers to these uh, uh, communities and infiltrates their institutions, and relies on these networks to launder illicitly gained funds from criminal networks, launder them, and take a commission to fund itself. Why Latin America? Again, because it is a center, a critical center in the global crime. It's, you know, 90% of world cocaine is produced, raised and produced, uh, processed and shipped from Latin America, and so they also play that part. And of course, these three elements are not mutually exclusive. They mutually reinforce themselves, cooperate, and facilitate Iran's uh, nefarious actions when Iran decides to launch attacks wherever it is in the world. It is on these networks which are permanently rooted in the country, have local knowledge and access to local powers that Iran relies on to carry out its attacks. It did so with Yamia. It did so with many other more recent attacks in the region. And um, I will stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we've got... Iran and Iraq, we have Iran and Latin America, and some of the global Hezbollah. I'm going to talk about what's going on right here. January of this year, Herzi Alevi takes control of the military. Within about a month or so, Israeli intelligence comes out with an estimate. Iran is going to be going after Israel on a multi-front basis more than ever before. Complete paradigm shift. So when something's going on in the West Bank, something's going to be going on in Gaza, Something's going to be going on with Hezbollah. Suddenly, even though it's not that Iran completely controls any of these groups, they're going to be trying to operate all of them at the same time to create a feeling of chaos in Israel. And the Israeli military says, we're going to need to be ready for this. What are the big things that have happened since then? Um, there's been the major operation of Israel in May against Islamic Jihad in Gaza. Right? If you remember, this was not up against Hamas. Basically, Hamas that rules Gaza stayed avid, out of it. Israel didn't really hit Hamas very much. It was getting Islamic Jihad, which really does pretty much work almost entirely for Iran. So that was the May operation to try to deter Gaza from continuing to make uh, problems in terms of rocket fire and other things. By the way, keep an eye. As of August 30th, it uh, looks like Hamas might be trying to restart the strategy that they used in 2018, where they started to have people non-violently marching on the border with Israel, except if you know the history from 2018, there was a mix of people who were nonviolent and people with guns and people with improvised explosives. So you have to keep an eye on exactly the mix of the crowd. That could be actually a very big challenge for Israel going forward. We have July 3rd and 4th. Israel does a major operation in Jenin because basically Israel for a year and a half has been unable to stop terror from the West Bank. Um, at this point, the most Israelis have died this year in basically 20 years. This is now a worse if you want to call it wave of violence, fourth intifada, whatever it is, then even what they called the knife intifada of 2015, 2016, it's lasted about twice as long. There's no end in sight. Why? Basically, Israeli leaders don't have either a big diplomatic idea to change things or a big military idea to change things. If you talk to top Israeli military people, they do expect at some point that there will be some additional similar to Janine operation, like July 3rd and 4th, where Israel went in with massive forces and even used drones uh, for the first time in the West Bank in 20 years. But basically, there's, there isn't like a will to do that now. And then until they're really pushed by some you know, sort of major terror event, um, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. And there certainly is not an appetite to do a full-fledged uh, operation defensive shield like in two 2002. So if you don't have either a big military idea or a big diplomatic idea, we're in for terror for quite a while coming out of the West Bank. Then there's Hezbollah. So the major event actually with Hezbollah was in March. Hezbollah sent somebody across the border to pull off a terror attack in Megiddo, which is deep inside Israel. Um, Israel did not hit Hezbollah super hard at the time, but hit back a little bit and sent messages don't do this again. It seems like that was received because most of what Hezbollah has done since then has been more, I would call it sort of messing with the border. Vandalize a camera that's on the fence on the border. Rip apart a little piece of the fence on the border. The big thing that's going on is this tiny little outpost that about five or ten Hezbollah people established, according to Israeli intelligence, by mistake. 
uh, because there's a part of the border between Israel and Hezbollah that isn't completely demarcated, meaning you know you have like a line, but it's actually you know you can't see the line in the geography that's on the spot. Um, but once they were you know whatever it is a couple dozen meters over the border, um, and it's not near any Israeli soldiers or any Israeli civilians, and nobody caught it immediately, then they didn't want to leave, and they've been there for several months. And this is a major issue of tension because you have effectively a Hezbollah outpost in Israeli territory. And we're letting them stay because we're hoping that they'll move uh, diplomatically. I have heard from Israeli officials that they're not going to let them stay permanently. Some people think maybe they'll get cold in the winter and leave at that point. Um, but uh, basically, if they do have to use force, they will. But they want the diplomatic uh, things to play out. So you have all of these things sometimes happening at the same time. Israel has done, again, some, op some operations. But even the operation in Jenin in July, there were somewhere around 300 people of interest that Israel wanted to catch. They caught somewhere between 120 and 150. Where did the rest of them go? Myself and another military reporter recently asked some officials, and they said, what? There was no list of 300. I can tell you there was a list of 300 because somebody told us that at the time. So not everybody uh, was caught. Um, and so I think you're going to see a lot of little back and forth where there'll be medium large Israeli operations in Jenin or in Hebron or in uh, Nablus, wherever it might be. Um, but without really solving the problem, and that's why the, the terror isn't uh, going to go away, the you know, X factors in this, what happens with the Palestinian Authority? They've started to assert the authority a little bit more in Jenin, but not within the Jenin refugee camp, which is the biggest problem. They've started to assert their authority more in certain areas, but as long as people know that Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian Authority president, is old and isn't going to be around for very long, he also lacks some authority. The only other thing that could change things is maybe this Saudi normalization thing, which I'll leave for the end if we uh, have time. And now we have uh, Eli Carmon is going to talk about a grand global terror trends, modus operandi, and hostage diplomacy, and Hezbollah use of ammonium nitrate. And Eli, since he has a PowerPoint, gets eight minutes. Sorry. How are you open? Nobody to help? Nobody to help the uh, opening? Ah, okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my deep sorrow for the passing away of uh, Shabtai Shavit, uh, our chairman, uh, but also the role model uh, of all our uh, team. Uh, a fighter which uh, all his <coughs> career in the military and the intelligence has uh, fought uh, terrorism and who decided uh, after this uh, uh, wonderful career to help support a project of uh, academic research of terrorism and uh, we know and we see how ICT and other institutes developed after 9-11 uh, and in our case also after the uh, uh, second intifada. Uh, now, I would like to protest uh, uh, to the, our organizers of this uh, uh, conference because they put uh, Mr. Deddy Barnea, the head of the Mossad, uh, before me, so he stole my uh, presentation. In many ways, you see that uh, I'm uh, following uh, in his steps because there is a lot of information, by the way, that was uh, uh, published or even leaked by the Mossad, so I think we have a good idea what Iran is doing around the world. Uh, the rare times when Iran has been deterred from using terrorism in Europe have been when its leaders felt directly threatened. I mean, the leaders that uh, Barnea proposed uh, to, uh, to threaten himself. Such was the case in the Mykonos trial verdict in 1987 when the German High Court held the Iranian government guilty in the 1992 assassination in Berlin's Mykonos restaurant of the Secretary General of the Kurdistan Democratic Party of Iran and three of his associates. After the year, uh, oh, working, sorry. After the uh, signing of the nuclear GCPOA agreement in 2015, after 15 years, for the first time, the Tehran regime felt strong enough to wage in 2017 and 2018 a new wave of attack against opposition leaders exiled in Europe. And they say 15 years, they didn't dare to act in Europe. For the last three years, the Quds Force of the Revolutionary Guards and the Ministry of Intelligence have returned to use terrorism and subversion on a global scale. Fortunately, 
Uh, most of their plans have been foiled by excellent intelligence and international cooperation, and I am quite uh, confident that many of the foiled attacks were foiled by the Mossad itself. From January 2021 to December 2022, almost uh, 13 Iranian attempted attacks against targets identified with Israel and Jews were reported, including diplomatic missions and diplomats, business people, and tourists. The attacks were carried out by Iranian agents alongside local recruits, some of whom have a criminal background. And this is a new uh, opus modus operandi in the last two, three years. Be they Colombians, Azeris, or Pakistanis, in exchange for financial and other benefits. It is evident that Iran preserves for itself room for public denial by using local operatives with dual citizenship, in particular in the execution stages of the operation, but still taking control and involvement in the information gathering and logistical support stages. Look to Europe, and by the way, the uh, red dots are Israeli and uh, uh, Jewish uh, targets. The green ones are, uh, it's not so well seen, uh, it's, uh, I think uh, blue, are Western or non-Israeli uh, targets. Europe has uh, returned to BNIDA of activity with a preference for Cyprus, at least uh, two attacks, and even in 2012 one, and Turkey, at least three attacks, four attacks. Western citizens have also been targeted, like an American general in Germany, and a French journalist, a very known French journalist. The Caucasus remains an area of action. In Georgia, there was one attempt. Ten years ago, another attempt. And Azerbaijan, which is a, a country, a Shia country, which is an ally of Israel in the Caucasus, has been attacked in the regime itself in the attempt in April and May this year uh, to overthrow the uh, Azerbaijani government. During 2021, Iran tried to, cover, uh, to carry out almost seven operations against Israel, primarily in countries in Africa and Asia, where it enjoys easy access for establishing an infrastructure to carry out terrorism, and where its agents have already operated in the past, such as Ethiopia, Tanzania, Bernea uh, spoke about it, Ghana, Senegal, and India. It's a very interesting case in Ethiopia. Some 10 people were arrested, and they tried to attack not only the Israeli embassy, but also the American and the Emirates embassy. And more interestingly, the operator, the main operator of the cell, was in Stockholm in Sweden. So you see how complex this kind of operations began. The boldness of Tehran appears clearly when we consider the decision to assassinate on United States territory two important uh, personalities from the Trump area, John Bolton, former head of the National Security Council, and Mike uh, Pompeo, former Secretary of State. Moreover, they tried to kill or kidnap in her home Basi Alinejad, which is an Iranian very known journalist, an opposition journalist, and a human rights activist from her home in New York. Uh, Barnea spoke about uh, Iran's, uh, Iran's uh, strategy of hostage uh, diplomacy. By the way, there is an Iranian term for hostage diplomacy uh, declared by the Ayatollah Khamenei, honored diplomacy. In his uh, vision, this is a legitimate way to fight the enemy. And we have again a, a string of uh, operations trying to take uh, hostages in Iran, people from Germany, Poland, Italy, France, Netherlands, Sweden, and other countries for their alleged role in the popular protest against the death of Mahsa Amini, the known uh, young uh, Kurdish girl in police custody in Iran. Uh, the unidentified person were detained, according to the intelligence ministry of Iran, during the riots or while plotting in the background. <clears throat> Now, European and Euro nationalists are systematically used as political bargaining chips by Iran. Europe uh, feeds into the vicious cycle, and unfortunately, hostage diplomacy works because Brussels continues to negotiate for hostages. The very interesting uh, case is the one by uh, the liberation of a Belgian uh, humanitarian worker in Iran, arrested in Iran, in exchange or swap for a uh, intelligence uh, of, uh, chief of uh, uh, station in uh, Austria, uh, which was responsible for a big attack in uh, uh, Villepinte near Paris, uh, probably killing uh, hundreds of people. And uh, he was arrested in Germany. And for the first time, we had a trial of an Iranian agent or intelligence uh, uh, head of the station uh, for 20 years. Not only they decided to uh, two minutes, decided to liberate him, but they had to change the law 
in the Parliament of Belgium in order to find some kind of modus uh, uh, operandi how to make this kind of swap. Lastly, I want to show, uh, I think uh, I'm not sure that you uh, see uh, clearly with this kind of, uh, uh, of um, uh, presentation, the huge Hezbollah uh, and Iranian uh, arsenal of ammonium nitrate. So the people who saw in 20, August 2020 the explosion in the harbor of Beirut understand what means this kind of uh, operation. In 2009, they achieved huge quantities of ammonium nitrate, commercial one, in China, Guangzhou, transported it to Thailand, some 12 tons to Cyprus, some 12 tons to the UK, three and a half tons to uh, Bolivia, two and a half tons, Germany, 800 kilo, uh, kilo, uh, kilograms, and according to American sources also, in France, Italy, uh, Greece, and Spain. These governments, these last governments, did not recognize that this was the case, and uh, Fortunately, the United Kingdom and Germany, after the leakage of this information to the public, decided finally to outlaw the Hezbollah as an organization, not only the military branch. So in my opinion, the regime didn't pay a very high political and economic price, so it continues to be active, not only against Israeli and Jewish targets, but seeks hard to strike at the Western uh, United States and also neutral countries uh, without any uh, consideration for their sovereignty and their uh, security. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ellie. So now we have the sort of mini speed round. I think each of us has somewhere around like two minutes, sort of, um, to talk about Iran's nuclear pr program and Israeli options or American options or what the world uh, can get, oh, yeah. what the world can do. Um, uh, just very quickly, um, you know, so it, my, my book talks about uh, the, the Mossad's operations, that some that you've heard about, some that you haven't heard about, some where I have to say, according to foreign sources, the Mossad's operations. Um, and basically, but substantively, aside from all of this stuff is exciting, you need to figure out a balance between not just diplomacy, but also having a viable military option on the table and using covert operations. It would be nice if the CIA would help also uh, a little bit more sometimes, whether it's the Mossad, the CIA, whoever, to slow Iran down when you're in, we're in an in-between point right now, right? We have, Iran hasn't stopped. They have enough 60% uh, and 20% enriched uranium for potentially, if they make the decision, five to six nuclear weapons. They have that right now. So we're not anywhere near a satisfactory or tolerable situation. So sometimes that's when you need covert force if you're not ready to do the full military operation, which Israel certainly can do, but which the United States could do a lot more. But I don't think anybody in Israel believes the United States is really ready to do that. And then the big warning uh, also from, from the book is January 2025 and October 2025. So you can talk about go into the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, don't be in it. That's not the important issue. Whether there's a return to the deal or not a return to the deal, in January 2025, the snapback, the ability to do global sanctions on Iran expires. In October 2025, the hard limits, there's still some limits, but the hard limits on Iran's centrifuges, the machines that enrich the uranium, expires. It starts going up. So even if they go back into the deal at that point, suddenly, basically, you really don't have something to hold over them. Suddenly, they can have enough centrifuges that they could, you know, and people talk about the idea of breakout. They could walk out, conceivably. Um, so those are big concerns that we need to watch. We need to watch the Russia-Iran access. Mossad Director uh, Barnea last night hinted a little bit to what could happen if Russia gives something back to Iran for all of the drones that Iran has been giving to it, what, what, what happens if that's some sort of nuclear know-how to solve some of the issues Iran has had with detonation issues with the nuclear weapons, to solve delivery issues, miniaturization issues, any of that know-how that they give to Iran could suddenly shrink the time that Iran uh, would need to get to people say that if Iran went to 90%, they need another six months to two years to work out the weaponization issues, boom. If Russia solves those problems, it could happen a lot faster. So we have to keep an eye on all of those issues. And I'm going to go to Vera next because... Go ahead, I have no idea what No, okay. Um, will, you, will you talk about Abraham Accords? Huh? Abraham Accords in Iran? No? No, okay, you're done? Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, you were... God, my terrorists still don't have, you know... <laughs> okay, okay. All right, so Emmanuel? 
You so to comment on, on the nuclear file? The nuclear file, uh, yeah, what, what, what uh, Israel, the United States, the West uh, can do. So, um, but two minutes. Two minutes. Um, the <laughs> we've been using mainly sanctions for over a decade. And sanctions have been extremely effective at the beginning and somewhat effective later on at slowing down. Slowing, downs Iran, slowing down Iran's ability to procure, to, to build, to develop, to advance. Obviously, it's not the only policy. There's been other things like inconvenienced scientists who could not show up for work, that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is that when you look at uh, the Iranian nuclear program, you have to look at why is Iran pursuing it and, you know, What's their, what's their cost and benefit in last? This is not an apocalyptic uh, fanatic cult that wants to, to bring you know, the end of the world uh, um, kind of scenario. This is a rational thinking regime that has revolutionary ambitions. It is an hegemonic, uh, aspires to an hegemonic role. It's a non-status quo power. It wants to diminish US influence in the region. It wants to assert itself as the hegemon in the region. It, it has a vision for the world. It, it, it sees the opportunity to build a coalition with other authoritarians globally to undermine the rules-based order that they see as dominated by the West and the United States. They want to change that. They're no longer alone in that vision. So they calculate that in a cost and benefit analysis, continuing uh, to pursue their nuclear power will get them uh, in a position of ascendancy, right? And so ultimately, no strategy can work unless you add one component, which nobody in the West has treated seriously or is willing to say openly, and that is regime change. The only thing that will change that calculus ultimately. So we, we can make the regime do the 100 meter run like a turtle, okay? Carl Lewis will get across the finish line before. But eventually, the turtle gets there, okay? You have to change the turtle. You have to make them think differently. And how do you make this regime think differently, given that it is ideologically driven? You need to support regime change. The, the day that this regime is no longer driven by its millenarian ideology, its ambitions of hegemony, its lack of freedom in the country, its complete disregard for the rights and benefits and needs of its own population, then the regime will do a different calculus. Until then, you have to have mitigating uh, policies in place, and of course, sanctions will continue to be one of them, but it will not be effective if it is only done um, selectively, uh, inefficiently, uh, without motivation, without the resources, and without more international support. It worked in 2005 to 13, because the United States, European Union, uh, and their allies, Western allies, were able to mobilize the international community enough to make it bite. Today, that is no longer there, and we need to recreate that goodwill and coalition to put that pressure on the regime. Failing that, Iran will not see sanctions as a threat that can undermine the internal stability of the country. Thank you. Um, Ellie, one minute and 48 seconds on Iran and the nuclear file. Uh, personally, I think that uh, in the present uh, local, regional, and uh, global context, there is no option for an Israeli military uh, attack on Iran to destroy all of its nuclear infrastructure. Therefore, in my opinion, uh, we need some three, four more years uh, for a medium-range uh, nuclear agreement with the United States, Europe, and the Iranians, and permit Israel to prepare thoroughly for better uh, international context, and perhaps also for a change of regime. I'm not sure that we can influence, but from within, perhaps, will be some change. And uh, as I said, we need several more years in order to prepare for it. Thank you. OK, um, do you want to say 40 seconds about U Ukraine? No? Okay, um, we're finishing 45 seconds early. Has that ever happened in history? Thank you, everybody.